All right. Uh, well, hey, guys, thanks for spending an hour with me. I hope you all have uh, learned some good stuff and had some good interactions with each other at Path to Agility. Uh, this is my first time here, and actually, it's my first time in Columbus. I'm really enjoying it. This is a really pretty campus. I went and ate uh, Schmidt's last night. It's really good. <laughs> Man, I don't know if I should come back here. It's, it's just, oof. But yeah, I've had a great time. Thank you all for having Lean Kit. Thank you all for having me, and thank you all for spending an hour with me. Uh, my name is Daniel Norton. I am uh, one of the co founders of Lean Kit. I currently help run several of our product development teams. So I run the mobile team and the web development team. And, uh, you know, over the course of our struggles and growing and going from a, a team of guys in a basement to, uh, there's, I don't know, close to 70 of us now, just growing out a team beyond some guys that were really interested in lean and really interested in, you know, Kanban and Scrum and things like that to, you know, a wider group of developers and marketers and salespeople and all that that were, um, didn't grow up in this kind of stuff the way probably everybody in this room did. Um, you know, there were little challenges with getting everybody indoctrinated with things that we've kind of taken for granted for a long time. So I came up with, or we, several of us, came up with this idea of FizzGood, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it um, in a sec, but uh, I kind of hope what it is, is, is it just kind of distills down a lot of the, the stuff that we've all been spending all these years reading uh, into, into it, just a little bit of a, it's sort of a thought, a mental tool that you can apply to, hey, we're about to embark on this thing that we want to get done. Does it fizz good? Uh, so there's, no, I hope, I hope actually, there's nothing that we're going to talk about today that, that is like, I, I have a new way to think about lean. I kind of hope it's not that, right? What I hope is, is, is you hear things along today, it's, oh, you know, this is respect for people, and this is limiting your work and process, and this is all of these things that you're already familiar with. It just, I hope that all it does is just kind of, you know, makes the, the back of your neck tick a little bit with stuff that you already know. So FizzGood is four ways that are somewhat independent, but definitely work together to think about this project or thing or task that we're going to embark upon. So frequent, small, good, and decoupled. And kind of the, the way that this is, I guess, I don't know, worked out around the office for us is we, we take that, ac that, that acronym and say, well, does this fizz good? Yes, this fizz good. I think we should go about doing that. And we say, no, this doesn't fizz good. Let's think about this together a little bit more. Um, so probably a way to start out talking about what all this stuff means is let's just take apart each one of the words and kind of compare it to what the opposite thing is. So if we start with frequent, what I want to say is, and I might, for the most I think of this talk, I'll kind of couch this in terms of product development because that's what I do. Um, um, gosh, you know what? I remembered something sort of important. Let me go back and just tell you guys if you want it. The, the, I made a PDF of the slide deck for this. And if you come and find me at github.com slash Daniel Norton, it should be in one of my public repos. Also at linkit.com slash FSGD or FizzGood is, we haven't updated the presentation yet with the new branding stuff. Uh, we recently redid our company logo and all our colors and everything. So it's got a slightly older version. But so the one in my personal GitHub is the one I just uploaded a few minutes ago. And the one out here, and I, I've got this stuff later, but if you wanted, I don't want to keep any, I don't have any like prestige, you know, like ha ha, ta da thing at the end of this presentation. So if you want to get the, the PDF right now and, you know, click along with me, please feel free. Okay, let me go back to where I was. Okay, so there. Okay, so when I talk about stuff that we want to build, we're going to do a project right now. We're going to work on a new item, um, a new feature in the product. What I want to do is we're not building things on a particular, like an annual cadence or a quarterly, or we're not going to, well, we did something a few months ago, and then we got busy doing something else, and now we did four things, and then uh, we're not going to work on it for a little bit, and we're going to do something else. What we want to do is we want to put stuff, we want to get things to done as frequently as we can. 
Um, here is, this is kind of old, it's from October, but this is a version history of the Facebook mobile app. And you'll see that Facebook, it, this, I'm sure this is hard to read, that, so the thing up here is the important bit. Facebook has gotten themselves into a cadence where they started off putting things out into the App Store every four weeks, and that worked for them for a couple of weeks until they were like, this is great, and then they started moving stuff into the App Store every two weeks, which is effectively the review cycle at Apple, right? So as soon as, and this is effectively what my mobile teams have done, is as soon as Apple has reviewed a version of Facebook and said, ha, this is good, you guys can release it to the App Store, they do so, and then they immediately put another one in queue ready for review. Um, so what's happening with it, and if you came to the, the safe talk that was in this room just a little bit ago, it, it felt kind of, I know there's, a, there's a, a, a tickle on that side to sort of the release train. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna push something and whatever I have available that's done and tested and all of those good things, so far I'm gonna put this and package it up and we're gonna go. Uh, the way this is working out really well for my mobile teams, particularly because of this imposed bottleneck that I don't, I don't have any control over, I can't control when or if Apple is going to review my stuff, is as things are coming out of QA, that just gets tapped onto the, the top of the list. Of, so here's, here's the next little thing that we've done that's really good. I'm going to put this on top of the list, and then Apple's still reviewing. Okay, well, here's another little thing I can put on the list. And as soon as that gate opens up from Apple, they say, here, the, the version we're reviewing of our app is good. Put it in the App Store. Now I have a spot available to put something else in there. Whatever the best thing is, the newest and latest and greatest thing is that's coming out of my team, that goes into review immediately. So what, what used to be kind of a bottleneck that used to be you know, kind of a bit of a problem for us, like we don't know when, you know, reviews and things like that, it's kind of actually not turned into one really so much. There's always something coming out. And now, so this isn't just uh, you know, web companies are new companies like, whoa, simmer down there, uh, like Facebook. This is even what you might think of as older companies like Microsoft are adopting this strategy. So um, they're saying things, you know, stuff that they used to work on and have these biannual, these giant releases, you know, where you go to Walmart and you get Windows 98 off the shelf. It's not the case anymore, right? That's not a reality that we live in anymore. They're moving all of their stuff into a far more iterative cycle. In fact, I think since these slides have been put together, I think I read that, like, what is it? Is Windows 11 or whatever it's going to be called? Like, that's it? They're going to get into a cycle where they're just constantly putting new minor updates. So it's not like BAMO version of Windows. It's little itty bitty improvements to Windows. And this isn't just the products that we release out to a customer. This can even be internal things, right? So. Um, Document, like internal amounts of documentation or uh, marketing material maybe that we're going to work on together inside the company. This is um, our operations team, you know, building stuff that customers are never going to see, but they, I want to do frequent improvements to however we're doing things. And there you go. It just came out of me, right? That's uh, one of those little things. If we're all here and we're talking about lean and we're talking about agility and we want to talk about small, frequent improvements to what we're doing. Speaking of small, so that's kind of obvious, right? The opposite of small is big. So if I'm going to be frequently putting things in, in if, if Facebook is going to be frequently putting things in the App Store effectively as often as Apple will allow them to do so, well, they can't be rewriting Facebook every two weeks, right? So it's just little itty bitty incremental improvements. Um, and there's actually some math behind all of this that uh, smarter people than me have done more research than I have about this. So I'm sure a lot of you guys know or have met or have seen presentations by Don Reinertsen. Um, and I have, so I'm stealing straight up uh, a little bit from him on this one, or hopefully attributing properly. But um, you know, you've seen presentations where we talk about, say, a highway, right? So if there's nobody on the highway in the middle of the night, with the highways at 0% utilization, that means that your cycle, you're, you're getting from exit A to exit B, it's gonna be pretty fast, right? And if the highway is completely full, it's at 100% utilization, how fast are you moving? You ain't, right? And then, so that's something we all already know, right? So let's take a look. So here's some math that Don has done. Um, take a little bit of a look at so if I have a team right now, and I feel that that team is at a 90% utilization, that means I have 10% of their time is slack or waiting or not doing or whatever that is, 
Um, and I have absolutely no whip limits on that team. Um, so what does that look like? That looks like, according to some of this math, let's, let's try this out. So we would have an average cycle time of a thing. So from the time I start a thing to the time the thing is done, let's say that takes 10 days, right? Of course, it's, I imagine some of this input math on this level of things is a bit arbitrary. But if we just have a look here. So if we said, OK, it's going to take me 10 days to get a thing through the system, let's try limiting our work in process. And let's not do anything totally dramatic. Remember, we want to do we're lean thinkers, and we're on the lean journey, and we want to do small incremental improvements. So let's say it wouldn't feel onerous, right, if I said, let's do double our current cycle time as a whip limit, right? So I did, I, let's, let's not put ourselves in a position where we're just going to blow it out and have 800 things in process. Let's just say, let's have a max of 20 things going on right now. And hopefully, that's something the team can go, yeah, OK, that seems legit. By doing just that, according to Don's research, I can take my average cycle time down from 10 days to 7.2 days. That's a 28% faster return. And you, know, and you think, oh, man, I'm going to have people sitting around. They're not going to be working. That's really only a change of 1% slack time. Taking that the next level up, doing the same types of math, things get almost like a little bit more than half faster. right? So it's that going all the way back to Limiting work and process. I hope we, as lean thinkers, we kind of think, yeah, that's probably a good thing. Here's some little bit of math behind that. Limiting work and process is a really hard thing to do if I have, say, those 10 things uh, that are going to, in my work and process limit, if one of them is refactor all the things and the other one is add a button, that gets really tough, right? So, we started with, so we had frequent, small, frequent. We want to do things as quickly as we can. And we want to do little things, just little itty bitty things as quickly as we can. So the next level here, this one I guess is kind of obvious, right? So I want to do little itty bitty things as frequently as I can. Uh, I want to add a new button. I'm going to stick with that one. I tend to reuse that one a lot. So I want to add a new little button onto Facebook. Well, obviously, you, I don't want to break it, right? I, this button doesn't work. If I tap that button, Facebook crashes, right? I, I definitely don't want to do that. Um, I have a little, there's a, there's a little tweak to that that I'll have in a, in a minute or so. But just to move on with it, um, so uh, at if and else, that's the Twitter handle of Jim Cowart, who's one of my developers, or actually one of my team leads and architects. Um, he's put together a, a little, another little, uh, mental exercise that says, well, okay, adding the button, I want to make sure it works. And here's some ways that we can make sure that we're, we all know and we can all agree that it works. So he's put together for his team, you know, TLDR. He doesn't want to put together all of this prescriptive, what it means to be good and all those things. So for him, you know, TLDR, too long, didn't read. It's this simple. Did you add a new button? Was the new button tested? Do we have unit tests and integration tests and all those things about the button? Does it log? So in case, like, this thing breaks, we will know about it, and the ops team knows about it. Have I documented it so another developer can come along behind me and know here's the dependencies and here's the things you've got to do to fire up the button and make sure the button works? And was it reviewed by another developer? However good we all think we are at doing our jobs and writing software, we need each other, right? So uh, has it been reviewed by another developer before? And you know, it, there's pretty easy things that you can do in GitHub with like that, like, you know, do a pull request. So, the opposite of good is bad. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I want to frequently do small things that work and put those into my system. But here's a more subtle one, is the opposite of good is perfect. And that's something, just being something that's kind of hard to, for us to appreciate, right, for each other. Um, so Reed Hoffman, founder at LinkedIn, he says, if you're not embarrassed by the first version of your product, you've launched too late, right? And how many of you guys can feel that, right? Like, I'm not going to bring it up, <laughs> but I can, if you do just a brief Google search, you can find what LeanKit looked like in the early days. And well, and it hardly, not only did it not look great, uh, it hardly did much, right? But it was enough that we could try it like, hey, do people, are they going to care at all about Kanban? Um, and can we build a business out of this? How many of you guys have seen this? This thing, so honestly, this has caused a fair amount of spicy debate in our office. Uh, 
one side of the debate says, look, you can't take a skateboard and just somehow magic it into a bicycle, right? It's a skateboard, is a, I mean, I can, okay, maybe you can put a pole on the skateboard like Marty McFly, you know, the, like the kids in Back to the Future, they had the box on the, on the thing and he pulled the box off and it was a skateboard. Look, maybe you can put a pole on a skateboard and it could become a scooter, but you can't go any further than that, right? The skateboard is just a skateboard. Well, that's one side of the argument. I think for those of us that are on the, the flip side of the argument and say, well, I don't know, my, my take of this is not so much that you turn the skateboard itself into a scooter, into a bicycle, into a motorcycle, into a car. It's that I have a dream and I want to build a car company. And I've, I've scratched and saved and I have $10,000 in my pocket. So how many of you would recommend to me that for my business model, I'm going to build all the wheels that I need for my first year, the first however many cars I think I'm going to build, and then after I've built all the wheels, I'm going to start building all the chassis that I'll need for all the cars, that, and then I ran out of money. Right? Over. Game over. So where I, where I kind of see this is, the bottom one is, I'm going to start by making a, a skateboard company, which is kind of cool because I actually recently got back into running skateboards. Uh, I'm going to build a skateboard company, and I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm going to learn manufacturing process and sales and marketing. I'm going to learn all about bearings and wheels. And I'm going to take that knowledge and I'm going to take the profit from selling skateboards and I'm going to make that into selling little scooters. And I'm going to take the profit and the knowledge and the customer base from that to make bicycles to motorcycles. Then I'm going to get to, I have a car company where I'm selling cars. So the skateboard wasn't the perfect representation of my dream of making a, a car company, but it was the thing that allowed me to keep going and keep marching forward and getting to my dream. How many of you guys bought one of these? <laughs> Something like it in my hand right now, right? The very first iPhone, wasn't it amazing? Oh, it was revolutionary, right? Um, I didn't get one when they first came out. I got really excited about the sec I got really excited about the second one because I watched that keynote where Steve Jobs got up and he said, hey, you can write apps for the iPhone now. And here's an app store. And uh, we've, Objective-C has been around forever. I personally, I love Objective-C. I know hardly anybody does, but I loved it, right? I, I, I was, my personal like developer appetite at the time was like I was doing a lot of Microsoft stuff and I was like, oh, you know, I'm just not. And that came along and I like, whew, chucked all that stuff and dove face first into this because this was a brand new market, right? But it wasn't here for the very first iPhone. In fact, cut, copy, and paste wasn't even on the very first iPhone. I mean, come on, right? Like, you would not buy one of these things now if it didn't have the most basic feature like that, but we thought it was okay at the time, right? But what that very first iPhone did was it proved a market. It proved their ability to manufacture the things. It was all the things they got accomplished at that time. And if they just said, we're not releasing any iPhones ever until we have app stores and we have cut, copy, and paste, and we have FaceTime, and we have front and back cameras, and right? I, would, they, would they have released one ever? I don't know. Who knows? Whatever that thing is that's going to come out this summer, we're not releasing any iPhones until that. Think of the uh, billions of dollars that they've sacrificed to getting to that point. I don't know, maybe you and I are on different levels of scale there, but it's still the same concept, right? Okay, so I want to put out as, as, as frequently as I can little improvements. I mean, isn't that lean? That's lean, right? Frequently as I can, little improvements. And I want to do it in such a way that if I'm adding a button to my stuff and you're adding a button to your stuff, I want to do it in such a way that you don't have to wait on me and I don't have to wait on you. We can work, we can work together, of course, but we're not going to do a thing like, I can't release nothing until you release all your stuff. And you go, well, I can't release anything until you release yours, right? Well, <laughs> what are we going to do? So um, here's just, I'm, I promise I, I don't want to like sell, here's a link that works and all that stuff, but here, here's a, a a slightly simplified version of some stuff we were working on recently where, you know, on the left-hand side, here's a task card, here's stuff that you're working on, on the right-hand side, goes, aha, you can now drill in and have like child tasks and all these things, right? Well, it was a big thing, lots of customers wanted that. Um, we were all, as a company, really excited about that thing, and there were many different parts of our organization that had many different things to do with that. 
One way we could have thought about that is to say, okay, well, we need to have launch day, right? And we're gonna have launch day and we're all gonna release this stuff at the same time. And we're gonna have, of course, the back end of all of this, we need all the back end database guys and we need to make new APIs, right? And we need to, and the mobile application is gonna consume that and all of a sudden, ba-ba, subtasks are a thing. And the browser we're gonna, is gonna consume that API and ba-ba, subtasks are the thing. And hopefully these two don't break each other. And the marketing team is gonna have all this new material of like why your life will be so much more amazing if you have this feature in our, in our software. And the sales teams are gonna get on the phone that day and tell customers, look, you, 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 your whole company is gonna fall into a ditch unless you buy this thing from us, right? All of these things, launch day. No, no, no. Uh, actually, we got to a spot where um, the API team, I don't think that they were entirely done with stuff, but we understood where we were going with things and the mobile team was able to write what the mobile team needed to write to consume that new API. And they actually, I'm gonna go backwards, they actually put their mobile app out on the app store with all the code that needed to understand how this worked before it was even a thing on the servers, right? So the app fires up and it says, do you have that new? No, you don't. And it just skips right over it, right? So it was kind of a really neat moment for us in that I had an update or a change to my mobile app that didn't require a down at the moment update in the app store. Like you already had the app on your phone. You'd had it for three or four days and then this new feature fires up. Same for the marketing team. The marketing team can't, like, how are you gonna do that, right? You're gonna, I'm gonna make all this collateral, I'm gonna do screenshots, and I'm gonna do webinars and things like that, but I can't do it till it's in production, you can't put it to production until we do the marketing, <laughs> right? Um, I'm reading this book right now, um, I'm really digging it. So microservices is kind of, a, I don't know, the hip buzzword at LinkIt these days. Um, and in the first couple of chapters, you know, it talks about, I mean, basically this concept is kind of what I'm talking about right here. Instead of building the giant monolithic web application, I'm gonna build little services that do this little piece and they tie into the little bit of the infrastructure and they're replaceable by themselves. Um, one of my other colleagues kind of describes this in, in terms of you can build kind of a house of cards where all of the things, all the cards stack up on each other just right, and there it is, and it works. Now the cards are individual pieces, right? I can replace a card, but it's gonna be really hard to replace a card way down here, right? Is it, so comparing that to a house made out of Legos, right? I can, you can kind of like tear out a little Lego at the base and replace a Lego without the entire thing falling down. It's really hard to do with a house of cards. So that uncoordinated, decoupled, being a positive thing, instead of a coordinated or you gotta have your stuff before I gotta have my stuff and we gotta have all this stuff together. So, but there's another subtle opposite of decoupled, as the, or damaging as the opposite of decoupled means, I'm gonna be doing frequent small good things, I'm gonna be adding that button, I'm gonna be adding this filter over here or this search over there or change your icon over here thing, but I have to do it in such a way that even though you're doing something else over here, you're adding your own button, I need to add my own button in a way that doesn't break your ability to add your own button, or doesn't break an old button that you added last week, right? Because then if I do that, I'm just gonna cause all kinds of chaos, right? So we know, uh, based on what we've talked about so far, that frequent small bad, decouple, well that's, not, that's bad, right? I put out bad software, I'm gonna have to rework it, so that's no good. Um, so if we take a look at frequent small good, hey, my button works, but it's damaging. I've hurt somebody else. Now they're like, what happened? My thing used to work and it doesn't work anymore because somebody over here broke my stuff. How many of y'all know what this means? Does anyone know what this means? It's Latin for first do no harm, right? So I'm gonna be trying to do good and that's a good thing that we all wanna do. But before I do good, I wanna make sure I'm not hurting you in the process. That actually comes out of the concept of bioethics, right? And in bioethics, there's, so there's two, um, well, there's several principles of bioethics, you know, justice um, and self-determination, all these things. And, but so there's, there's not two things here, beneficence and non-maleficence. And I kinda of feel like those maybe possibly help me to tell the story of what's the difference between do good, and what's the difference between don't do harm? So beneficence saying, I wanna add value, I wanna help you, you know, I want you to feel better. And non-maleficent says, while I'm doing that, I don't wanna cause any additional hurt to you. So 
that's where these two things really need to go close together. And of course, if we get all four of those things and each team is ordering their work in such a way, oh, here's a happy, here's a happy time, right? I think I've gone way fast on this. We're going to have to talk for a long time. Um, so common pushbacks. Um, in trying to integrate this into my teams, I've had this kind of unique for me experience of we try this out with a team and a team says something like, well, that's not going to work for us. We, we do this and this type of work and uh, you know, it, it's, this is never going to work. You know, we, we, we can't do this, we can't do that. And I said, well, okay, well, here's why. Let's work through this together. And we work through it together and they achieve some success and they, they feel good about this process. And then I've moved on to another team and said, hey, we're going to try this thing out. And I get the same pushback. I'm like, wow, that's kind of neat. You know, because it's, it's like I kinda, a, a rare thing in my career. I know what to do. <laughs> um, so here's some of the, the pushbacks that, that I hear on things like this is, well, you know, uh, so one, I, I don't know if I'm being entirely too transparent on this one, but um, I'm, I'm designing the new look and feel of the application. So frequent small changes, little itty bitty tweaks in here to the UI, that doesn't apply to me. Like if we're going to change the UI, we've got to change the whole entire thing, right? Or if we're going to rebrand the company, we need to rebrand the whole entire thing at one moment. So to that I say, um, open your phone and go into your iCloud settings and there's a spot in there where you can you know, like log out of your account and there's a, there's a little button for forgot your password, like if you wanted to, go do that right now. Up will pop this very old looking, like iOS 6 looking screen of here's how to type in your email address and it's going to email a password reset button to you. And you think, oh my gosh, Apple, aren't they, all, aren't they always perfect? Don't they always have all of their UI and marketing material and all this stuff always matches all the time? No. Even the ones that try the, oh, sit still, try the hardest to do that, it's just not possible, right? Um, so maybe where the inspiration of where FizzGood came from in the first place was this. Well, while we're at it, we should. Uh, we got ourselves, it was one of those things where we said we had several different things lined up and, and we wanted to do a big announcement to the community like, hey, we did all this stuff. And we, we were sitting there, the work wasn't quite done yet and the marketing material wasn't quite done and the marketing material was going to take a little bit longer than we thought it was going to. And so some of the other development teams said, oh, hey, I've got a few extra days. I'm going to add this and this and this and this, which is something that everybody totally wants, right? And we're like, yeah, that'd be great. And so we did that, and we spent all this, you know, we got all this stuff, and then we all did a release on the same day, and the marketing material went out, and it looked great, and people loved it, and it was on Twitter, and all these things. And we got to the end of that, and we said, man, that's really awesome. Good job, everybody. Let's not do that again. Uh, the while we're at it, that's actually become sort of this thing, in, in internally, we say, oh, no. You say, while we're at it, we should know. Let's get that first one out the door. Get it out the door, and see that you get value from it, make sure that it works, make sure that you didn't break somebody else. And if there's this other little thing that we want to do later, let's do that other thing. Because we'll know on the other side of getting the first part of it done that the second part is valuable. So the same one with, we have to coordinate this release. We have to make sure that all of our ducks are in a row and we look like real professionals. Well, you, we, we may feel that way. Again, this kind of goes back to Apple thing. We may feel that way about other companies because we're not them, right? We don't see all of their warts. All that. We're not however much of a Facebook user you, know, you might be or a Pinterest user you might be or, or you know, the biggest uh, Adobe fanboy in the entire world, you, you still probably don't notice that there's those little seams all over the place and well this doesn't just, this button over here, this color choice they made over here doesn't perfectly match this one over here but you notice that really hard about your own work right? as we hope we do, right? Because we do strive to do good things. It has to be perfect the first time. The first time the user sees this uh, if it's just not perfect, they're going to, you know, burn us to the ground. Well, no. You know, again, going back to that iPhone. The first iPhone, by right now, standard wasn't perfect, was it? Um, let me jump down to, this bug is a showstopper. Well, and, that, and this is actually one, I, I'm just being uh, transparent about this. There's, there's a real serious trade-off with this one, and this is, I don't, I don't have a, like, here's the answer to that one. Sometimes, yeah, okay, well, we can't release right now. We need to stop, pull the end on cord, 
why is this, why, what happened? Why do we, what do we need to fix here? We, can't, we do get maybe possibly sometimes out of a cadence because we have a bug that's really gonna affect a lot of users. Sometimes there's a little bug that's sort of an edge case bug that may affect some users if they hold the thing just the right way. But like, is this, is this bug so important to hold up all the other value that a user is going to get out of the things we were going to release? Or do we really need to stop all this stuff? And maybe possibly a better answer of, well, can we release all these other things without the thing that introduced that bug? That'd be even better, right? So whereas I think when we first introduced FizzGood into our organization, that was one of the responses I got a lot of was, oh, we can't do that. We've got this show-stopping bug. And I, and I wanted to challenge that and say, well, you know, okay, this, I understand it's a bug and I understand it's one we want to fix, but we want to get this stuff out the door faster. And mea culpa a little bit here is I, what I feel like the message I gave, I gave the wrong message, was so you're just telling us to just push junk out into the marketplace and out into Google Play and we'll just fix it later. That's, that's got, what that got internalized by some people. And oh man, I, I've given the wrong message here. That's not what I mean. So I think on these bottom two, um, yeah, it, it's just, it, it's still for us, I think, a work in progress because I don't want to give the message of, you don't want to push bad and I don't want to push damaging. I want to push good. But sometimes it's good. Like good is good. Good isn't perfect, right? Yes? Uh, I just want to clarify. Uh, when you're talking about, you're, you're not saying, you're saying when you go to production, it should be production quality, but that doesn't mean it has to be best design you might come up with. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Okay, not that, not that uh, you'd be pushing bugs in them just because you fix them later. Right, yeah. I'm sorry? You know, I, I, like I'm saying, like I think it's, I think it's a case by case basis. You know, if it, if it really is like, ah, oh, this, hardly anyone's going to notice. Another, another, just uh, way that we've tried to to look at things like this is just about everything that we build is featureizable at runtime later. So there might be situations where you say, okay, well here's this, these things are going to go out the door, but this one part of it doesn't work right now. Well, let's let's push the code, but let's turn that off for everybody. So I can, I can do that, run, and then at, at runtime later, I can say, oh, well, we fixed it. Maybe there's something on the server that we needed to fix. So that, doesn't, that means I don't have to redeploy a, an app, or I don't have to change anything about our web presence. And I can flip the switch and turn that feature on, and now people can use it. Were there other questions? Sir? Well, I think it's all about defining Showstopper. Mm -hmm. The Showstopper for my UX person is far different than a Showstopper for my business person. Yeah. Or my developer. Yeah. If my page doesn't load, that's a showstopper. If something's three pixels off, that's not a showstopper. I totally agree. <laughs> Sometimes you have to have those like, well, conversations with folks. I totally, yeah. Thanks for saying that. There were some more. Can you describe your journey to become more featureizable and convincing people that it's much better to put the tight end? Oh gosh, there's uh, no. That's awesome. There, there's actually there's a lot of benefits even right up front with that. I mean, first off, um, yeah, you have the benefit of I can test something, I can try it out, I can make sure I think this works okay. Like as far as my QA process is concerned, as far as my unit integration tests are concerned internal smoke tests, internal tapping around and stuff like that. I think this is good. And then I can put it out into production, but it doesn't hurt. Well, yeah, that's, I don't know if that's the right word. I'm making this up as I go, right? But I can put it out, I, the code is out there and I can say, is my environment stable? Before then I can release it to some users. And so, you know, th this kind of goes into A-B testing, right? And I can turn that on that way and it's good, it's no good, you know, whatever. I can iterate, but also, so, but that's, I think, more of a product level of it. At a, at a marketing and sales level of the organization, that gives my marketing and sales team the opportunity to, they can kind of tinker with the packaging of the app. So I have like the free version and the team version and the super premium version and dirt to dirt, all those kinds of things. They can do whatever they want with it. And in fact, they have. I mean, you know, there's, 
I, they can repackage that. They can even do A-B testing of different packages. We'll put this thing in this package and that thing in that package. And so, and describing it that way to them, usually they're like, yes, give me all those, you know? And, and if you do it right, um, I don't know that it adds piles more complexity to the system. I don't know that it adds piles more time. And I just said that, and maybe I just disagreed with myself, because I kind of feel like we've been doing it so long that I don't, I don't know, maybe I'd, I don't feel the, the pain as much any, it was like it's just something you got to do, right? Kind of thing. I don't know, was that that answer to your question? Yeah, we're just struggling. Like, oh. Our organization started to become even deeper. Yeah. Well, it's the, it's the same overhead as like unit tests, right? I mean, it's, it's throwaway code that I'm never going to be able to bill anyone for. Like, well, you'll know when <laughs> you can't. Um, yeah, I'll know. I'll, maybe I'll, if I can, at the end, I'll circle back around some, some other things. That, but I think to that, like, we want to make a case at some level up above us that this work we're doing right now is valuable to the wider part of the organization. So that might be... You know, the tack I would take is this gives you the ability here from a business perspective at runtime, not at build things time, to make agile decisions about, uh, you, I didn't know agile. You make decisions about, you know, how this product works in this customer's hand. For, for our company, um, depending on what we're doing with things, so if we have uh, a planned update, so like, 1.2.3, if, if we're releasing 1.0 and we're like, this is almost done, we might as well throw it in so it can be activated in 1.0.1, mm -hmm. that's something that we've, we've been doing typically. Yeah. Um, so you're not turning a minor update into a major feature switch. Um, yeah. So, so what, if it's all there, might as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that's just what we've been doing. Yeah, yeah that's cool. I think having buy-in to the minimum viable product on every level of the organization is also important. If the VPs know that concept, like, does this particular feature help me sell more product? Does it sell more ads? Does it do this, this, and this? How is this feature helping my business? And if there are ways that you can tie that to goals of the company, that's when those things start coming. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask about OSGI. It seems like they have the same philosophy. Uh, if you use that, does it help uh, enforce this kind of thing? Um, no, honestly, I haven't. When we, were, when we were using it, it's exactly, it forced us into doing this because you actually had to separate things out into reusable pieces or OSGI. So, it's just way it was. Yeah. yeah. Right behind you. To his question on kind of getting buy-in and not maybe feature creep everywhere, do um, you find yourself, after a feature is truly stable, removing the branch? Or do you leave the feature branch and logic everywhere always? Most of the time, we leave the feature branching logic everywhere just because, you know, for us, pardon me, for us, the sales and marketing team continue to tweak the packaging of the application. However, that example I showed a minute ago of the new you know, one of three thing done, the, the face of a, of a task card, in that one I did actually remove some of the code because it was this feature is not like, there's stuff about the API that it, it, I look at the, if I look at the data that I get back, it, it's not going to have any of this data ever, you know, whether the, at all. So if I don't see that data, I need to paint the UI in a certain kind of way. But if I see that there's data, then I say, oh, hey, the app can do this now. Can it do it for this user? And then, you know, then I paint it a different way. But that code that says, does it do it at all, I, that rip, got ripped out. Because once, once it got put out there, then that was sort of a different story, right? It's like, well, I'm not going to ever, I'm not going to ever take this out of this, well, knock on wood. <laughs> I'm probably not ever going to take this out of the system. I just might disable it for this customer. All right. So 
we came up with this. It, uh, we feel like it's helping our teams. Um, and we thought, you know, this would be a good thing. We just went ahead and put it out there uh, and, and put a creative license on it, or creative commons license on it, that you guys are absolutely welcome to take this uh, and use it inside your organizations. I think, so I don't have them right now, but I think, you know, as we're doing more, we've actually done a lot of these talks. As we're doing more talks on this FizzGood idea, this FizzGood concept, um, you know, we might make stickers and booklets and who knows what else, right? Well, well that'll be the next small improvement we'll make to the FizzGood thing. Um, but yeah, I encourage you, like if this was, you know, valuable or if you feel like you can take it to the next level, I, that'd be awesome. Take it into your organization and, and do with it as you, as it would be beneficial to you guys. Um, I know I'm like kind of crazy early, so we can keep talking or we can go get some coffee together. Um, so I'm Daniel and there's my, my contact stuff and uh, there's FizzGood. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate you hanging out. Oh yeah, because oh yeah, absolutely. It, particularly, you don't have to get very big at all to where you have like if I'm if I'm going to be doing frequent changes, if I want to if I want to ensure that I'm not breaking you, if I'm going to ensure the decoupled portion of this, like I cannot, I can't hand hand do these things. So absolutely, automation is an important part of continuous delivery, which is kind of the goal. For the what part? For the feature? Yeah, I'm almost kind of embarrassed to say no. It's all mostly custom written. It should be. There should be a framework for that. Like your question makes me think. Yeah, I should have done it that way. <laughs> No, but that's not terribly dissimilar from, yeah, like I, I one, I, I think that actually totally applies, right? I mean, what you're, you're doing, you're moving the ball forward with your thing without waiting to like, I, I'm not doing anything till all the conveyors are in place, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> 